This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the podcast of Man Library's Chats in the Stacks book talk series. In today's talk, originally presented at Man on October 13, 2011, Walter DeYoung of Cornell's Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics provides an overview of topics covered in his newest publication, The Complete Book of Potatoes. Beginning with the potato's importance to human civilization, Dr. DeYoung's talk touches on this crop's versatility in food and non-food uses, its disease-resistant varieties, conventional and organic production techniques, pest management, storage practices, and the sometimes surprising culinary qualities associated with different varieties. Thanks very much. Um, if you have questions in the middle of the talk too, that's perfectly fine. I have a PowerPoint talk and I can't, my wife at the back cannot hear me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak louder. Um, so I, I've prepared a talk um, in case no one asks questions, <laughs> but I, I fully expect that some of you will want to interrupt and wave your arm wildly or something and hopefully I'll, I'll notice. So the, today I'm talking about a book that I was part um, of writing along with my father and um, Joe Sheska. Um, there's a picture of us here in the, next, in the next slide. Me on the right, my dad in the middle, and Joe Sheska on the left. My father was a potato breeder with Agriculture Canada throughout his career. Joe Sheska is retired from Cornell. Um, he worked on most of his career on Long Island. Both of them spent their entire careers working with potatoes. Assuming I have a normal lifespan, I'm closer to the beginning than the end of my, of my career uh, in comparison. So those, my, my two co-authors in particular provide an, an awful lot of um, well, practical experience uh, in the book, much more so than, than I did. I guess that's enough said for, for that. So the book covers uh, a wide range of topics. Clearly, there's the subtitle, which I'll get back to in a minute, about what every gardener and grower needs to know. Um, in terms of growing potatoes, but also covers a lot about the history of potato, um, where it was domesticated and how it moved around the world, common diseases of potato and some other interesting, interesting tidbits. Uh, I'm just jumping around through various parts of the book today, not in any um, specific order, trying to get the stuff that's relevant from the gardening standpoint out of the way earlier in case I run out of time. So potatoes are currently the world's third most important food crop but what's kind of amazing is that 500 years ago, they were only located in South America, and they weren't grown anywhere else. Um, it wasn't until Europeans came to um, South America and brought them back to Europe, at which point they didn't do much for 200 years. But in the, the last 300 years or so, the spread of potatoes has been phenomenal to the extent that they're now the third most important food crop in the world. Um, there are a variety of reasons why potatoes have become so popular. Uh, one is that they're nutritious, for example, having a lot of vitamin C. In the North American diet, with per capita potato consumption, about a third of our recommended daily allowance of vitamin C comes from the potatoes alone. Um, a lot of potassium, and, and while not so much protein, the protein's actually a very high quality. In addition to that, potatoes produce an awful lot of calories per unit of land. So especially if you're poor, um, and you have a limited amount of land and you need to survive, potatoes are a really good choice um, for of a crop to grow. And in addition, potatoes have an awful lot of genetic diversity, which allows breeders to adapt them to a wide range of environments. So it's that combination of things which has led potatoes to become so popular and, and, and widely grown throughout the world. Um, potatoes were first domesticated, it's thought about 8,000 years ago around Lake Titicaca, which is on the border between Bolivia and Peru. Lake Titicaca is the highest navigable lake um, in the world. And in order for potatoes to become domesticated and spread around the world, there were really two key things that had to happen. The first was that we had to find ways to deal with glycoalkaloids, which are bitter and toxic compounds that accumulate in wild potatoes. And the second, which I get to, is about becoming adapted to, um, to long days. You probably have experienced what glycoalkaloids taste like when you've eaten a part of a potato that's green. The green is just chlorophyll, that's not a problem. But um, when it, potatoes are exposed to light, they also produce these glycoalkaloids, which are, are bitter. And if you eat enough of them, you'll get quite ill. And if you eat too much, you'll die. So 
there are different ways to cope with glycoalkaloids. Um, in some parts of South America, this is not widespread. It turns out they've discovered if you eat a particular kind of clay at the same time as you eat potatoes, you're good to go. <laughs> um, another one is this ancient process of freeze drying the potatoes that is still currently practiced in some parts of the Andes where the potatoes that have glycoalkaloids um, are left out to freeze at night and then are trampled um, um, <clears throat> to break them open and um, left in a stream for the glycoalkaloids to leach out and the starch is left behind and the, the um, very lightweight product after you put them out again on, to, to dry um, is called chuño. And you can store it for a year or more. So it's a, it gets around a problem that we, we have with potatoes for long-term storage. Um, if you freeze dry them, you can store them for a long, a long time. And the way that, of course, that has really allowed potatoes to become widely adapted is for someone to have early on identified plants that were relatively low in glycoalkaloids and then selectively propagated those. And that, of course, is what we currently eat as potatoes, or potatoes that are low in glycoalkaloids because someone identified them um, those that had low levels and, and, and multiplied them. Another big uh, and important development for potatoes to spread around the world was for them to become uh, adapted to long days. So potatoes normally, wild potatoes normally will tuberize only when the days become relatively short. And so if you took a, a wild potato from the Andes and brought it here, um, you'd get no or very few potatoes. Most of the time um, the potatoes would freeze before the days became short enough for them to produce uh, enough of a crop. So um, this is a process that took um, conceivably quite a long time um, and it's something that breeders have been dealing with over the past few centuries uh, as well, adapting potatoes more and more to be adapted to, to long days. So the, the end result is that while potatoes started off in a little area um, in South America a few thousand years ago and spread a little bit within South America. Today, if you look at where potatoes are produced, it's all over the globe. Um, and potato production has continued to change even over the past um, 20 years in particular, where now S Southeast Asia produces a, a remarkably large number of potatoes. China is now the world's number one producer of potatoes, and India comes in second. Together, those two countries produce a third of potatoes. I'm guessing that most of you don't think of Chinese as potato eaters. I can't say that I did either. Um, I was in China this past summer, and uh, certainly in northern China, finding potatoes isn't hard. They're, they're just about everywhere. This is a picture of a mountain I took. I called it Potato Mountain because that's all they had on, um, on the mountain, potatoes as far as, as far as the eye could see. So again, just in a few hundred years, um, potatoes have spread phenomenally. I'm sure that when Columbus came to America and subsequent explorers, you know, they, were, they were thinking about bringing riches back to Europe in, in the form of gold and silver. But you know, with the aid of hindsight, really the two big things that they brought back from um, the Americas were potatoes and corn, the number three and number four food crops um, around the world. So the subtitle of the book, you know, what, what do you really need to um, know to grow your own potatoes? Um, having grown up in a Baptist church, I feel like I need to give a three-point sermon. And so these are my three points, just to get straight to the chase, and then I'll just meander. So the first thing is, is that choosing the right variety makes a big, big difference um, in your success, and I'll elaborate on that. The second is, is that starting with certified disease-free seed um, also makes a really, really big difference um, in terms of your success. And since I need a third point, um, Adding some fertilizer and water helps too. Um, I won't comment more on fertilizer than wa and water, other than to say, if you want a specific recommendation about um, three and a half pounds of 10, 10, 10 fertilizer per 100 square feet, and keeping water, keeping the soil moist but not um, drowning um, is good. Potatoes do need a lot of water. In Ithaca, in our well-drained soils that my breeding program operates in, we're aiming for at least an inch of water a week. Okay, so potato varieties differ in an awful lot of characters. Any two potatoes in particular are far more different from each other than any two of us are different from each other. And of course, we all like to think we're very different from each other. Um, potatoes have more genetic variation um, than, than, than most crops. And so 
If you take any two potato cultivars, you'll find that they differ in a large, large number of traits. Um, you'd expect them to differ in disease resistance. You'd probably expect them to differ in yield. Maybe you've realized that they differ in cooking qualities and eating qualities. They also differ in the length of the growing season and how well they store and uh, an awful lot more. And so this sort of comes to the point of choosing a variety that has the attributes you want. It's kind of important if you want to be successful. Currently, the most popular potato variety in North America is Russet Burbank. Um, it was developed by Luther Burbank in the late uh, 1800s. And it has high yield and excellent taste and stores really well. Um, so I guess the natural question is, well, what's not to like? And I pick on Russet Burbank because to illustrate the point of why it's important to choose a right variety, if you grow a Russet Burbank in New York, Almost all of your potatoes will look like this. Um, the eyes have sprouted and formed tubers, and sometimes a little tuber on that has the eyes on it then form additional tubers, and it just gets really, really hideous. Russet Burbank is really, really hard to grow in New York. In order to grow it well, you have to manage water um, exceptionally carefully. It's hard enough to do out west, and it's really hard to do, uh, really hard to do here too. So. This is the kind of thing that can happen if you don't choose your variety well, in addition to just having really low yield. Um, by the way, Russet Burbank was not actually the potato that Luther Burbank developed. He developed a potato that was just called well, Burbank's seedling, and it wasn't russeted. Russet Burbank is a mutant of the original Burbank, um, and it has um, russet skin, unlike the original Burbank. That's the only difference, it has russet skin. This has actually caused a big problem for potato breeders uh, in the century since because um, consumers have come to associate russet tuber skin with high quality. Um, russet skin has nothing to do with quality per se, but if that's what you expect to see in the supermarket and that's all you'll be willing to buy, breeders who develop potatoes, uh, particularly in the West, are forced to develop potatoes with russet skin, and it's a hard trait to, to develop. Um, I guess it's listed here that the, the russet Burbank was found 20 or 30 years after Burbank was, the seedling um, came about by a, a farmer in Colorado. Luther Burbank wasn't actually impressed with Russet Burbank. He thought it, was, <laughs> it wasn't a good thing. Um, this is a picture of Luther Burbank. That's actually a postage stamp. As far as I know, he's the only plant breeder who ever made it onto a postage stamp. Certainly the only potato scientist who, who made it on. I think all potato breeders aspire to getting their picture on a on a postage stamp. So I suspect that many of you have never really considered that the starch content of potatoes has a profound impact on cooking and eating quality. Um, so in particular, potatoes with high starch um, are very well suited for making french fries and potato chips, primarily because they absorb less oil. Water in the tuber gets replaced with oil when you fry it. And the more starch you have, the less water you have, so you don't take up you don't take up so much. So French fry companies and potato chip companies like potatoes with, with high starch. Um, potatoes with high starch tend to have a very mealy texture and are kind of um, somewhat dry when baked, um, but also um, disintegrate when boiled. So if you want to boil a potato, I don't recommend boiling high starch potatoes unless you want them to disintegrate. As a rough rule of thumb, it's not absolute, most russet potatoes are high in starch. On the other hand, um, low starch potatoes generally hold together when bo boiled, and if you bake them, they're kind of, they're kind of moist. And these potatoes are, are more suitable for things like salads. And as a general rule of thumb, red skinned potatoes um, are low in starch. I never realized until I became a potato breeder why I liked red potatoes. It has nothing to do with red, per se. It's that I personally prefer low starch potatoes, but I know uh, many people um, have a preference for high starch potatoes. My observation when we were running blind taste tests in my own breeding program was that the primary differentiator between people was whether they prefer high or low starch, and I think you'll each know who you are. When it comes to round white potatoes, they can be all over the map. Some are high, some are low. Um, it just depends. So I've already illustrated why I think you probably don't want to grow a russet Burbank in your garden, so I, maybe it helps if I give you something that I would suggest that you grow. Um, the favorite potato of my favorite potato and that of all my staff, and it wasn't because I dictated it should be the favorite potato, 
my staff actually convinced me that it's the potato I should eat, um, is Andover. And on the side wall over here are 10 pound bags of Andover that you're free to take with you and eat um, <laughs> yourself. So you, you can see this. For, um, it turns out Andover was developed by my predecessor, Bob Playstead, and was originally intended for making potato chips. In my first few years at Cornell, I didn't want to eat it. Like, why would I want to eat a potato for potato chips? <laughs> Until we began running these blind taste tests and it kept coming out on top. And I, eventually the data persuaded me and I've been, eating, <laughs> I've been eating Andover ever since. I don't want to pretend that Andover is the easiest potato to grow. Um, it isn't. The vines are kind of weak and if there's a drought, it doesn't hold up very well. But in terms of eating quality, it's really good. And anyway, you can see for yourself if you take a, take a bag. So uh, additional attributes of Andover is that it matures early. I mentioned that potato varieties differ in their maturity and when you can, when you can dig them. Andover, oh, you can dig them as early as the end of July, middle of August, that's fine. They, the vines mature early. Um, store is okay. And in terms of eating them at home, in general, as a breeder, I don't try to develop all-purpose potatoes because potato markets for French fries and chips and fresh are quite, are quite different. But it, I consider Andover but as all-purpose as they come. And so in our experimental plots, when we have an extra row on the outside of a plot, we plant Andover. We harvest a lot of Andover. And it's what yeah, I and my crew eat. So if I had to make a single recommendation, it would be to grow that. Um, Sure. Not, so not very good. <laughs> the question is how how, resi how resistant is Andover to late blight? And I guess I maybe I should expand on that. Nothing has good blight resistance. Not very, not in general very good. Late maturing varieties tend to have better blight resistance than early maturing varieties. Um, but well, nothing is, is is especially good. Nothing's completely immune. Um, in the book, we actually provide descriptions of about 55 potato varieties. The book is intended for, uh, primarily for an audience all across North America, and we had to cover potato varieties grown everywhere. What I'm doing in my next few slides is just picking on some varieties that I think, if you want to grow potatoes around here, are, are reasonable choices. Um, of course, you can grow more than I'm describing here, but from my experience in this area, these will, will do fine, and it's a, a bunch of different types that I'm suggesting. Um, if you'd like to grow a red, um, Chieftain is an old variety. It's been around for quite a long time. It has good eating quality. Uh, it's widely adapted, meaning it will grow well just about anywhere. And in practical terms, what that means in a given region is no matter how bad the growing season is, you'll still do okay. It's also resistant to common scab, a trade I'll get to in a minute. If you like yellow flesh potatoes, oh, there's a table in the middle of the room where there are a few of the varieties that I'm talking about today, there's some chieftain there, and there's also some cuca gold. Cuca gold is the yellow flesh variety named after Cuca Lake, one of the Finger Lakes. Um, if you want to feel like a hero when you're a gardener, grow some cuca gold. <laughs> and I, I say that because cuca gold is the highest yielding variety that was ever developed by Cornell. Again, released by my predecessor, not, not by me. And it's really hard to go wrong with cuca gold. It'll certainly crush Yukon gold in terms of yield. Um, and the eating quality is also pretty good, and it's resistant to common scab, um, which is an attribute that I think many of you will find you wish you had resistance for when you grow potatoes. And when we've run, put potatoes into various organic trials, cuca gold has typically come out on the top of yields in those trials as well. Not to say it's so resistant to everything, but it just yields so much that you still get a decent yield um, regardless. So common scab. Common scab is a soil-borne organism. Um, it's kind of ubiquitous. If you put not completely composted compost or manure in your garden, increase the organic matter, you're likely to have increased problems with this. Nothing is completely resistant or immune to common scab. It's all relative. Um, but well, these are four different potato lines that were grown in the same field. And you can see what I mean by relative. Some of them held up pretty well, and some of them got hammered. Um, if you see deep pits like this in your potatoes, look to see what's resistant to common scab and plant that next year in your garden. Some, I can guarantee some of you will experience this. <laughs> just, just pointing out that in terms of an important attribute in varieties, if you have common scab, is to look for something with resistance. 
Lake Chieftain and Cuca Gold. Another fun potato to grow is Caribe. It's a purple skinned potato with um, bright white flesh. It's also early maturing. Um, probably the most embarrassing moment in my entire life was when I once asked my dad after I'd been here for a few years if he knew anything about the variety Caribe. And he said, yes, I bred it. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are certain things you can only walk into when your father and you are in the same profession. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I suggest Caribe if you're interested in a purple skin um, potato. Uh, another potato that some of you have likely heard of was released um, during my time here, but was, the, the breeding was largely done by Ken Paddock, a former employee in the potato program, um, Adirondack blue, which has completely purple flesh. All blue, which might be a purple flesh variety you know of, um, does not have completely purple flesh. All blue is not all blue. All blue is blue and white. Adirondack blue is all blue <laughs> in terms of being completely purple. If you cook Adirondack blue, I'd suggest not boiling it because the purple pigments are water soluble. Um, and will leach out. Bake it or microwave it or fry it, um, and you'll retain more of the purple color. We also have released a variety called Adirondack Red, which is red inside. I don't have a picture of that. Picture of that here. For me, one of the more interesting potatoes I've seen in the past few years is Papacacho, a Chilean heirloom variety that was introduced into New York State by my colleague Keith Perry, who runs the New York State Seed Farm. He's in the Department of Plant Pathology. Um, Papacacho doesn't yield very high, um, but the tubers are really interesting. There are a couple of Papacacho tubers on the table um, and a potato from a cross with Papacacho. The tubers can be like eight or ten inches long. I mean, there's, unlike anything you, you'll find in the supermarket here. So if you just want to have fun, Papacacho is fun. And I think the last potato I'll mention um, that's described in the book is called Ozette. Ozette um, is different than most North American potatoes because it didn't take the usual trajectory of potatoes uh, into North America, meaning from um, South America to Europe and then spreading to North America. Ozette seems to have come to North America directly from Chile, brought up by Spanish um, explorers and um, brought to um, the Native Americans who lived on the West Coast at the time. It was found uh, a few years ago that the Macaw Nation um, we're growing Ozette. It's a really special potato to them. They are unwilling to sell it to anyone, but they are prepared to give it to you as a gift. So they think that it's, it's too important to sell, that it can be given um, uh, as a gift. I hate to admit that you can actually buy this from at least one company on the internet. <laughs> but um, Ozette uh, has well, it's somewhat long yellow flesh with lots and lots of eyes, kind of a Pine cone, pine cone appearance, and it has a it has a unique, unique appearance clearly. So, earlier I mentioned that there are three things you need to do to ensure your success. Um, choosing the right variety um, is important, and another really big one is starting with disease-free seed. So. If you happen to repeatedly plant your potatoes year after year after year after year, you almost inevitably see that the yield will dramatically decline over time, maybe just one season. And this happens because potatoes accumulate diseases, especially viruses. Once a potato plant has a virus, all its daughter tubers will have a virus, and they'll act as a source of inoculum the next year, and um, yields will go down. So the way to get around this is to every year, start with um, what is called certified seed. It's certified to be free or at least very low um, in diseases, especially viruses. I actually don't know if you can still do it. I know when I last looked, you could buy certified seed of some varieties from Agway and Ithaca. Um, you can also buy certified seed from lots of different companies on, through mail order or uh, on the internet. Supermarket potatoes are generally not a good source of seed in part because they may harbor diseases that you don't know about, and sometimes because they're sprayed with sprout suppressant and they just won't sprout. So that won't get you anywhere. So if you, um, you should really start with, 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 with disease-free seed. In terms of 
what to do with the seed? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so the, the levels that you would find, um, um, the FDA will, or whatever agency regulates this, will have deemed are not dangerous for your health. But what they do is they stop the, the sprouts from, um, from growing. Well, they can be plant hormones or various analogs. Um, It's, well, the, the, the industry is trying to move away from sprout suppressants and is looking for potatoes that have longer dormancy, but it, it, you know, it, it can be an issue. Um, yeah, so you're going to plant potatoes. Depending on what size of potatoes you get, you, you'll find you may have to cut them. Ideally, it's, it's easiest if you get little potatoes that are about two ounces in size and you can plant the seed pieces whole. But if you get them larger, um, you have to cut them. This is sort of a diagram. It's, it's from the book about how you can cut round seed pieces in order to ensure that each piece has at least one eye. Um, and the final seed pieces are each about one and a half to two ounces in size. If you're cutting seed from a long potato, well, you really only have one choice about what axis you'll cut them on. Just make sure you cut them so that at least each piece has at least, has at least one eye. A question I get asked a lot from potato novices is how deep to plant. And I guess questions that follow after that is how far to plant them apart in a row. I'd say nine inches or so is a good starting point for how far to plant them apart in a row. And how far should the rows be apart? About three feet. Um, in terms of how deep to plant, well, I guess I'll answer the, first, the question first. About three to four inches is where you start. And it helps to consider what a how a potato plant grows to understand why we have to plant them at that depth and why we end up hilling the, um, the plants as the season goes on. So initially, you plant the seed piece. It's sort of diagrammed as the mother tuber here. And the roots go down, and the shoots go up. Potatoes are underground stems. And, so, um, and they form at the end of horizontal stems that we call stolons. All the stolons, of course, have to come off of the, the, the stem that has gone up. So they're all starting at a point that's higher than the mother seed piece. So daughter tubers form above where the seed piece was. So you need to plant at some depth, um, three to four inches, I guess is what um, we're recommending, um, because that, so that the plants, the tubers can form, you know, there's still soil for them to form. But not too deep, because if, it, if you plant the potatoes too deep, it takes too long for the shoots to come up, and there are all sorts of soil-borne fungi that can attack them and kill them before they ever make it. So there's this balancing act um, in that regard. Of course, when you're growing potatoes during the year, you normally pile some soil up, um, up on the stems on, on either side, a, a couple more inches. The purpose of piling that soil up is to ensure that any potatoes that form near the surface of the soil don't get exposed to light, turn green, and then accumulate those glycoalkaloids that, that you don't want to eat. In general, you should aim for a broader peak rather than a really sharp one. You don't just have to cover potatoes with soil. You can also um, use straw to cover up potatoes. Just put them in the bottom of a furrow and um, either put some soil on and then use straw as the mulch. Or if you want to, you can just put straw on them, quite a bit of straw, mind you. It helps if the straw doesn't have any weed seeds in it because rodents come in, initially eat the seeds, and then eat the potatoes. <laughs> so, um, but if you manage to pull this off without um, without covering the potatoes at all the soil and the seed pieces, then your potatoes will be soil free in, in, inside the straw. Um, you can also cover potatoes with black plastic mulch um, in, in, instead of straw. Black plastic mulch helps to warm up the soil so your crop comes, comes up earlier. If you green sprout your seed, seed pieces, I mean leave them out in the, the sun, which keeps the sprouts short for a week or two before putting them in the soil. That also speeds up how long accelerates the time to which you can um, harvest your crop. And you can also start potatoes from true potato seed. And by, so potato scientists distinguish between seed potatoes, which are tubers, and true potato seed, which are botanical seed that form in fruit. If you haven't seen potato fruit, they look just like tomato fruit because potatoes and tomatoes are 
closely related, and there's, there's a picture of some. Um, you can either, well, typically if you collect seeds on a plant that you haven't deliberately fertilized or pollinated like plant breeders do, it'll be a self. Um, the plant will have selfed. Um, and potato exhibits inbreeding depression, and the yield of the potatoes that you get from the seed will be less than the plant you started with. Each of these seeds, um, in distinction from the question you asked before if you're planting tubers, each of these seeds is a genetically distinct individual. This can make it fun. You can make crosses so that you end up with white potatoes, red potatoes, and purple potatoes um, all showing up from your seed. But um, there are, there's a, a big drawback in starting with, with true potato seed. Actually, there are two, two big drawbacks. One is that there is no uniformity in the crop. You know, of course, that could be what you're aiming for. Um, but um, if each plant matures at a different time, it's a bit of a pain to decide when you're going to harvest, for example. Um, so you know, this is just a photograph of true potato seed after it's been dried. And you can also buy from some companies pelleted potato seeds, so it's easier to work with, and you can plant an individual one. The other big disadvantage to growing potatoes from true potato seed is that it takes a lot longer to get a crop. So you have to start them indoors, just like tomatoes. You can't wait until you normally plant potatoes and plant one and hope you're going to get a decent crop. So you treat them like you would tomatoes, start early, growing them indoors and transplanting outside um, if you'd like to try that. The big advantage, and this is um, of planting true potato seed compared to tubers, is that most viruses are not transmitted through true potato seed. So in some developing nations where viruses are a problem and labor is really cheap, they'll plant TPS. But most of the world plants tubers. And there's just a picture of some little potato seedlings. So for the most part, potato breeders, and there are only about 12 of us in North America, we're about the only people who work with potato seed and potato seedlings every year. I plant, my program plants, well, not this past year, but generally 20 to 30,000 of these every year. A, a question that often comes up when you work with potatoes is, oh, wouldn't it be cool to graft a tomato on top of potato and you can get tomatoes on top and potatoes underground? <laughs> so this is nothing new. Luther Burbank was doing it 100 years ago. Um, for the purposes of the book, my dad did it just to illustrate what happens. So oh, this is a tomato plant grafted onto the potato variety, Kennebec. Um, this this picture's in the book, too, and, and so is the next one. <laughs> Are there potatoes developing in the pot? Well, you'll see that in the next picture. So the tomatoes, the tomatoes did okay, but the potatoes, that's pretty much a bust. <laughs> so, I mean, the bottom line is the potato only, I mean, a, the graft, the plant only produces so much photosynthate, um, and the tomatoes seem to be winning the battle. The tomatoes also don't apparently be, aren't sending that much tuberization signal down to the tubers. So in terms of scale, this is the bottom of the stem. <laughs> you know, that's not very big. <laughs> so the, the yield was, you know, by the, time, by the time the tomato shoots were dying, the yield was not good. So there, there are companies that sell kits, you know. <laughs> I, you know, nice, <laughs> nice idea, but it just doesn't work so well in practice. I, I, I admired my dad for, for doing it. Um, so I've already mentioned one disease in potato that's a real nuisance, and that's common scab. Common scab, by the way, there's no chemical treatment for common scab. Well, actually there is, but none that you could use. The only one I know of is you can fumigate your field with tear gas. <laughs> And, and some, farmers, farm, some farmers do it, but it's expensive, a few hundred bucks an acre, you know, it's, not, it's nothing we can do. So if you have common scab, you're stuck with disease resistance or bust. Two other serious threats in potato are, are late blight uh, and Colorado um, potato beetle. Uh, in North America, I guess these would be the big, the big two that can completely hammer your crop. So if you're going to grow potatoes, I thought you should at least know what these look like. Um, if you find a potato plant with brown lesions surrounded by a light green halo. That's probably going to be late blight. If you look on the underside of a leaf when it's moist and the area that corresponds to the light green halo is um, sporulating, you see this white powdery stuff? Yeah, that's, that's late blight um, that you have. Late blight, ten, hmm. late blight spores can travel great distances. Um, and if it's cool and 
prolonged wet, so it's perfect conditions for late blight. There is now um, a nationwide network that monitors where late blight is that you can, USA Blight, I think it's called, if you Google it. Uh, you can sign up and they'll send you emails about where late blight is located each week. Um, this isn't in the book because it only formed, this network only formed in the past few months as far as I'm, I know. Um, and you can discuss, you can find that, uh-oh, late blight has been found in Pennsylvania or Western New York, you know, my time is, <laughs> my time is nigh. If you do find late blight, probably the best thing you can do is just kill your vines, chop them with a weed whacker or something and let the, or let them die. Leave the potatoes in the ground for at least two weeks. And the reason you do that is so that any potatoes, tubers that have become infected will just rot. You know, they're just gone. And what's left you can eat. <laughs> um, if you find it too early, well, I mean, if it happens too early, you just lose. Um, late blight, you know, is devastating. You can, it can completely wipe out your crop in a week. There's no, no doubt about it. In terms of resistance, there is some. Later maturing varieties tend to be better, but there's nothing that's, you know, highly resistant to, to late blight. Um, Colorado potato beetles are um, voracious and promiscuous pests. <laughs> uh, if you, any of you grow potatoes, you've probably seen potato beetles. And you'll often find them in this pose. It's not hard to find them um, like this. They will completely devour your plants. If you don't control them, within a few weeks, all you'll have left is stems. I've seen fields like this in Russia, just completely defoliated. Those were um, peasant fields. That was kind of sad. I've also seen them in experimental plots, which, you know, that's fine, but not when they're, you're trying to eat, eat them. Um, the, particularly for home gardeners, this isn't actually too hard to control. You just look for them and pick them off and crush them or put them in soapy water. But you also have to make sure you get rid of the eggs. You'll find them in the underside of leaves. They look like this. Uh, and also get rid of the larvae, which look, um, look like this. You'll, you'll typically see an awful lot of these hundreds on your plants, <laughs> and your leaves will be disappearing quickly if you haven't gotten them early, early enough. One cute way to control, or at least to reduce your problems with Colorado potato beetle, potato beetles overwinter in the soil during the winter, and they can't fly when they come up in the spring. They can, all they can do is walk. So if your garden location has changed, um, you can dig a trench and put black plastic um, in the trench. I guess it doesn't have to be black. And the potato beetles will walk toward the potatoes and they'll fall in the trench and land in the plastic. And then they can't crawl out again. It's just great. <laughs> and they just die <laughs> in the bottom of the trench. You, you can also use early in the season, um, I'll, say a, I'll say a flamethrower, a propane torch. If you singe the plants, not enough to kill the leaves, but enough to you can burn the legs off the beetles and they fall off. <laughs> this is actually used commercially. I'm not, they'll, they'll, tr they'll pull a big, you know, flamethrower that can, well, a torch the, over many rows simultaneously um, as a way to reduce the levels. Yeah. Oh, the number of ways to kill potato beetles is, <laughs> <laughs> my, my predecessor, no, not my predecessor, um, Ward Tingey was an entomologist at Cornell who just retired last year or the year before, I forget when. He'd, his talks at potato meetings were always well received by the growers because of the, he would describe the new mo modes of action of, of insecticides for potato beetles. I'll never, he talked about one which paralyzes the muscles um, in potato beetles and basically they'll bite and then they can't let go, <laughs> which for some reason the potato growers really <laughs> warmed to that <laughs> idea. Um, one last story uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, Maybe my favorite story in the book um, deals with one way that potato, I'll just jump into the middle. It turns out during the war, there were some wars between France and Prussia in the late 1700s. And it was observed that um, by, by the powers that be, the potatoes were a really useful crop to, to have because if an army came through and burned all the grains, you lost all your food. But if they tried to burn the potatoes, well, you still had the tubers underground. So it was to your advantage militarily if at least you planted some potatoes. So there was a fellow, um, Antoine Augustine Parmentier, who ended up being a, a high official in the court of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And he wanted to encourage the people on the outskirts of Paris to grow potatoes. Um, and he thought he couldn't convince them just by telling them to grow potatoes, so he adopted a different approach, which was to plant a large field of potatoes and then have it 
um, uh, heavily armed presence, heavily armed guard monitoring the field day and night throughout the growing season. And at the end of the growing season, he asked that the guard to leave. So the, the people who in the surrounding areas thought, ooh, something in there is really valuable. Let's go steal it. <laughs> and they did. Um, so, you know, that was just one of the small ways in which potatoes adoption was um, increased in, in, in Europe and led it to be so widely grown today. So that's all I have to say. <laughs>